Welcome to your Daily Dose of Theological German. We're on installment number three of this Hermeneutics of the Torah book that we started looking at a chunk of text out of here. And so let's get right to it. Before we start today, I just want to draw your attention to a lexical issue because you have this word here, literalität, which is a loan word. It's a foreign word. And as such, you will not find it in a standard German-English dictionary. You will find it in a German dictionary. You'll get a German definition but it probably is unlikely that you'll find it in Collins or Cassell's or any of the standard translation dictionaries because it's not actually a German word. And so you really want to be careful with this because you might be tempted to think that it's a cognate and that it is going to mean something like literal, uh, but it doesn't. And so you want to watch out. I am just going to show you what I got on Wikipedia, but you would get the same kind of thing in a standard German dictionary and sometimes you have to do this kind of work to get your head around a German term that's not actually a German term but has been borrowed into German you want to make sure you're understanding how it's been used in German so if we just take a quick look at Wikipedia you'll see what's going on here so this term on Wikipedia uh, is listed and in the very first paragraph you just see a basic description of it so the term literalität Okay, from the Latin litera or letter, buchstabe, means like a letter, like an actual uh, individual character of text, is comparable, this is an adjective, with the English literacy, usually translated as, uh, let's see, read and writing ability or education. And is, this is going to be, I think, a fake passive here, is as uh, loan word or foreign word also in the German language with this meaning used okay so basically the word here is actually literacy so it is a cognate to an English word but it's not a cognate to the English word literal which would be a very different meaning so sometimes you got to do this kind of work where you actually got to go read some other thing in German to understand the German word so let's go ahead and translate that sentence now so I've really been emphasizing this week about how a sentence can begin with only one of two things. Either it's going to be the subject or it's going to be some kind of uh, modifier. I don't want you to think that that means these are always really simple and straightforward. It's just that you know, because sometimes a subject can have several subcomponents within it. So here we have the case of the basis. That's actually the subject of the sentence, the basis. But then the subject itself is modified. And because of that, the modification has to then also come before the verb, but it's all part of one big phrase that is technically going to be the subject of the sentence. And so the verb is still in second position. It's just that you're modifying the noun before you get to it. But it does start with the subject. So the basis for, for what? The, and then you have this weird phrase for the, in the following. Okay, this is an overloaded adjective construction, which don't happen super frequently in German, but they're often enough to confuse you. And the telltale sign is that you have a very strange and confusing syntax that usually in German, if you translate it woodenly, you can still kind of see what's going on. And the overloaded construction is one where that starts to get difficult because you usually have some kind of a specifier, I'm gonna say, a definite article or a demonstrative, or sometimes an adjective, but an adjective that's functioning in more of a specification way, like all or some, or something like that. And then you'll have like a prepositional phrase. So you're like the in the following. I mean, that like, how can you even just deal with that in English? It's very difficult. So this is an overloaded adjective construction. And I just wanna show you quickly how to kind of parse it out and deal with it so that you can put it back into your subject properly and um, make sense of it in a good translation in English. So, so to deal with these constructions in German, the first thing you want to recognize is that being that it's an overloaded adjective construction, you want to look for the noun that's being modified by this overloaded adjective. And so you have your specifier, and all that's happened is really it's been separated from its noun. And so you just got to find the noun that it goes with. In this case, you have a noun here, Volga, but the, that's already got its own uh, definite article, so it's not that. The next word here, that's actually your adjective. It's a participle. So verfahren, procedure, that's actually the noun that goes with das. And so you'll have something here that's a little bit easier to deal with if you just read that and ignore what comes in between. The basis for the procedure, and then you want to make sure, sure you pick up this genitive modifier that goes with that, the procedure of textual coherence or the method of textual coherence. Okay, 
So the basis for the method of textual coherence, well, that's a phrase, a sentence, a structure that you can deal with. And now you just have to modify that in line with whatever the rest of this overloaded construction is. And so here it's a prepositional phrase, which means in English, you're probably gonna to wanna to throw some kind of a relative pronoun in there or something to make it flow properly. So the basis for the procedure of textual coherence that is used in the following. Now you have your verb is the literacy of the text. 